Good morning. Uh, I'm going to give this talk. Uh, I'm from Peru. Welcome to. Oops. Yeah. Uh, this is the right session if you're kind of lost. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, this screen, uh, I'm trying to just basically say that sometimes I get this when I uh, access the Drupal org site from my country. Uh, but I think everyone here is uh, it's really awesome, rocks. So I do appreciate for coming you. I, uh, I think every one of us here is very important. And I can imagine like 5,000, 4,000 uh, being in this conference. So it's great to be here. I'm Cordoval, uh, Luis, for those who know me. Uh, that's my nickname. And I do some uh, development. And I work for uh, Underground Elephant and do other consulting as well. All right, so let me get your attention. So I'm here to help uh, you solve problems in terms of uh, how you are, you are going to upgrade Drupal or other software and make it portable. So let's start with some numbers. This is a slide from a friend of mine, Jacob Salas uh, in UK. So he is here. Uh, presenting some numbers, uh, dependencies. So packages, for those who do not, do not know, uh, is a repository for worldwide uh, created packages in PHP. So most packages, or all of them, should probably have a place here. And this shows basically the, re the dependencies that uh, these packages have. So some, one, some packages are totally standalone, and they are the, ma the great majority. So that's the trend. Uh, some depend on Symfony, others on Send, other packages. But the trend is that we create packages that are pretty much standalone and well decoupled. That means they don't have other dependencies. Uh, this is another graph from Jacob. He's showing here uh, the dependencies of the Symfony packages. Those are listed on the bottom. And of course, the most popular one is the YAML component. And so he's showing how many pack other packages depend on this popular component. And I like to say that the green, uh, the greatest the green uh, height, the better, because that means uh, other packages that other than the bundles, bundles is, are specific packages related to Symfony in the Symfony ecosystem. But more packages uh, that are not bundles depend on YAML or depend on other components. So seeing a lot of green here is, is is, it's a good trend. So what I'm trying to say, basically, is uh, packages need to be standalone. Packages need to have uh, less and less dependencies. And if they do, they should have like dependencies of, of very well-known packages. This is another graph. This is mine. <laughs> uh, I basically did a search on uh, using PHP Storm for the usage of Symfony classes in Drupal core. So this kind of shows that Drupal is actually very well stocked in Symfony usage. And among them, you cannot see it, but uh, there is the event, uh, event subscribers. There are routing, a lot of usage there. So those are the main two picks. There are others, but pretty much, it's not really about the quantity. It's about the quality. So just know, or let's just uh, assert that Drupal is actually using the, probably the most important components in, in Symfony. Now, what's the whole point of this talk? It's about uh, avoiding certain situations with, uh, when, for instance, if you're a big company and release an API, in this case, an API that you can access over HTTP requests and stuff, uh, and then you break it, then you have to uh, post these kind of notices. That means like you are not, not, are not going to longer support some stuff, some functionality, and you're going to release new stuff, but you're breaking stuff, and you're making your users write new software or make new changes to uh, keep up with your advancements, which is good, uh, but at the same time, it's not the it's not the best. Maybe there is a better way, a better transition. So, Symfony has a release cycle. Uh, the yellow bars show uh, a time span for four months, and the dot blue is two months. So you can see across the years, like we're releasing version 2.2, 2.4, 2.5, and so on. The green stuff is the support cycle. So that means we're going to add uh, you know, 
bug fixes, uh, new features, uh, but those usually, the new features especially, they come into the next, uh, next version. And the reason why, uh, I guess I'm putting this backwards, but so in order to actually have an orderly uh, release cycle and an orderly process of not um, making our users, uh, you know, break their, their software or whatever they build on top of it, uh, Symfony released uh, a backward compatibility promise document, which basically tries to address uh, these problems for people that use Symfony. And in this case, Drupal is a big user of Symfony. And let's talk about semantic uh, versioning. So the word semantic comes from the Greek semanticos, and that word basically means it means something. So it means like it has some meaning in inherent to it or attached to it. Like when you see numbers like this for your versions, so suppose, okay, Drupal 8.x, what does that mean? So the 8 means something, the x means something else. And so what it means basically, uh, this is happening with uh, most, or we want that to happen for the whole entire PHP ecosystem of packages, and that's a feature, by the way, uh, components and packages. So uh, we want this to happen for all of the packages. So if you are going to release your package to the public uh, ecosystem or you're planning on releasing a software that other people will use, think about this, because those numbers have meaning and they should mean something very concrete. In this case, the first number means the major version. So Drupal major version is eight. For those who were in uh, version seven, you know, it's a great change, it's, it's a major version. The two means here that it's going to include new functionality, but it's not going to break the API. So going from seven to eight, yes, we break everything. You know, we've broken uh, APIs, we've broken many things. We, people need to really upgrade and mind these changes. So if it's a minor, so let's say 8.0 to 8.1 or, or so forth, that means like you're adding functionality but you're not breaking the API, you're respecting the API. And the patch last number is really just uh, for a, uh, a way to say, hey, you know, uh, you can upgrade safely, just include some bug fixes here and there. Let's talk about Symfony repository in particular. So you go to GitHub Symfony Symfony, you click on the release tags, and this is what you see. You basically, uh, if we actually are taking care of our say we are building Drupal, Drupal is using 2.4.1 at this point, and yeah, we're planning on uh, using the latest Symfony maybe or upgrading. So suppose Drupal was using 2.4.4 and we're going to upgrade to 2.4.5, this is what we should be interested in. So Drup uh, sorry, Symfony has a documentation for these changes and this is done via change logs. So if we're interested in 2.4.4, that means we, uh, we need to take a look at the change log uh, 2.4. And that's going to tell us exactly what bug fixes are included to it. So we're going from 4 and 5, and we talked about that before. That's the minor number, or the, sorry, the bug fix number. That means we're including some bug fixes, as you can see in the lower screen on your right. It's not important right now. The, the mechanism is what is important. Let's take a, a component within Symfony, suppose the class loader. And we know that Drupal is using this because it needs to auto load some classes to use them around. And we click inside the uh, component class loader folder and we found this change log also. But yeah, this is uh, probably a lack of documentation or maybe because the Symfony does um, subtree splits, that means like it gathers all of the components into one single repository. And so we, sh we want to see here because a lot of people is using more and more independent components, not Symfony, but just the components. Uh, in example, Drupal. And uh, we want to see here really uh, a detailed bug fix list for this particular uh, case. So if we move from 2.3.0 to 2.4.0, that means we want to see bug fixes and API changes, or uh, additions, not uh, breaks, not, you know, BCs. Sometimes they put uh, BC as, you know, to stand, uh, to, that stands for backward compatibility break. That means that they have really 
broken the API, and they need to be going to 2.5 or, or, or from 2.3 to 2.4. So, but there is a way that you can keep track even though it's not documented. If you click on the history and then only for that folder, then you will see exactly what has been done. So as you can see on that detail, uh, it's not critical, but you can see basically that Fabian has merged uh, some branches from 2.3 to include some bug fixes and, and such, uh, and this is basically record. Uh, every commit gets recorded, and we can see it there. So in case that it's not documented, and I want to upload, uh, sorry, upgrade the class loader component, and I want to include some bug fix that I really need because I'm releasing the next version of Drupal 8.2 or something, then this is going to be uh, where I need to go. So can, can we please, uh, please raise our hands? Who knows Composer? Okay, most of us. Drupal uses Composer, and sometimes I see dependencies in some projects. Uh, they use a lot of stars and, and stuff, and there is a use case for that. But sometimes, uh, because we're talking about semantic versioning, and it means something, we don't want to actually uh, always use this, uh, the star in the case that we actually are tracking all our dependencies correctly or very tightly. Uh, but we want is to convey meaning. And so I suggest we use uh, curly. Curly is like a tilde or operator, which means basically that uh, it's going to tell Composer, use uh, 2.4.1 in this case, or the next or the most significant um, lower number. So that means that it can pick it pick up 2.4.6 or, or such in this case. So it's not going to uh, download for you under your vendor's folder the 2.4.1, but it's going to download 2.4.6, okay? And so uh, don't put 2.4 only and leave it up to, you know, nowhere, no, nothing, but two po you should put 2.4.1. That's the uh, best practice, at least as my understanding from the documentation. And also in practice, I've tested this. So that's how it works. So in, in the overall thing, uh, composer.json is very important for tracking your, your dependencies. You want to actually have a very good uh, understanding of what you're using from uh, the com basic base components that you're using, whether that those be Symfony or whether those be Aura 2 framework components uh, that are well decoupled or any other same framework, you name it. And uh, Drupal is using a bunch of components <coughs> and it's probably going to be using uh, more than 20 components in the future, and it's going to split, the core is going, to, uh, or we wish it could split further into components. So let's talk about uh, dependencies. The problem of that we're trying to save us, uh, we're trying to um, examine is how we keep track, how we don't break our software, how we upgrade freely, so dependencies is important. Why? Because uh, when you have uh, some dependencies on your packages, mm -hmm. those could break too, and you want to tighten your um, your versions as well, uh, more specifically. So this package, for instance, the validator that Drupal uses, uh, has three dependencies, regular dependencies, and one of them is the translation, which is coupled, and the property access that is also coupled. Uh, you don't necessarily, uh, well, in this case, you necessarily must have those components, else this doesn't work. Um, and it's very popular. Now, the dependency injection has only one dependency, as you can see on the, on the upper part, where it says one required dependencies on the left. Uh, but it has three development type dependencies. That means that when you develop as a developer and when you're developing you will actually download three more dependencies, which are config in the lower part, expression language, and YAML. So that means your package is actually coupled, but you it's kind of like uh, hidden. This is kind of hidden because uh, there will be some classes that will use classes from these other dependencies and will couple your package. Or, you know, your, your package is not well decoupled. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, you can still use it without these other uh, dependencies, but you will probably at some point, you know, want something better maybe, or you want to actually upstream and request, hey, you know, let's decouple this. So in reality, it's pulling like four dependencies, not just uh, because the config component depends on the file system component as well. So you're actually 
thinking that you're pulling one, but you're pulling four more. Let's, look at, let, let's compare that or contrast this with the Aura SQL package, which is very uh, independent. So it has like zero dependence, so we, we're happy. And uh, yeah, well, this is uh, the version one, but the version two is coming up, uh, I think, this, these days. So, okay, we talk about packages, uh, we talk about dependencies, we talk about versioning, we, talk about, we talked about uh, the Symfony release cycle, this problem, and there are ways to, we can address this, and this being, um, and I wanna cite here a book from my friend, uh, Matthias Novak from uh, Netherlands. So he's writing a book, it's also already for sale, but uh, the, the principles that he laid out and also another book from Paul Jones uh, on modernizing legacy application. He's the author of uh, Aura Framework as well. To, uh, he has a team. Um, I, I like this vision because it promotes uh, the way that you, we're building the new um, era of packages uh, and how we are going to release them, how are we going to maintain them, how are we going to avoid uh, the people that depend on our packages to break, uh, to avoid to for them to break their software. And so if you look at the core vendor folder of Drupal, you will see these folders. And in these folders, we don't see, for instance, the config component because Drupal has actually trimmed that, even though Composer um, might also install it or the file system or expression language, we don't use them, so we trim them. So there are classes that have use statements with those classes uh, that, uh, from other components that don't exist. So if you use them, you'll break, uh, well, not necessarily break your software, but in some cases, like the container builder or, or some other classes in Symfony, you'll be using, uh, you know, you'll have to be very careful what to use and to avoid breaking stuff. So this, uh, the goal or how we are addressing is we have to have like two points of, points of view. In a way, we want to, uh, as package designers, looking inwards. So inwards meaning our code in, a, in the package designer's uh, you, uh, uh, land. And in the other, uh, which it would be out, outwards, outwards that, me, that would mean um, package uh, or looking uh, outwards to the user side, user land. So in this case, we're talking about uh, inward. So the extension point points from the standpoint view of the package itself. So pick up YAML. YAML is the most simple component you can pick, the most popular, and it has only two methods, actually. It's very simple. So suppose you write a text file, and you uh, put the extension YAML, and you put these kinds of food, like tacos, burritos, fajitas, and you're going to write a menu, uh, sorry, yeah, menu.php file, and in there, you're <laughs> gonna require, of course, your auto load from Composer, but you're gonna basically parse it. So you take the YAML, you call the static method parse, you pass the name of the file that is on the same directory, and options is going to be a variable containing all those three type of foods, okay? This is very simple, an array containing three elements and those type of foods inside. That's all you need to know, really, about how to use this package and how to, you know. Now, Drupal uses these packages, uh, this package to do configuration stuff, so all your services, core definition stuff, all goes in there with this type of parsing. YAML parsing. Uh, so, okay, so in YAML recently, like this week, uh, someone actually wanted to put a feature inside, and they wanted to add this mapping to a standard class, so that when they do, for instance, add like fajitas comma, something like an object with curly braces and stuff, you will actually get a standard uh, class object in your inside your variable options, okay? So what to do for that, they added a new argument at the end. So instead of parse having three arguments, uh, the last one with the default values, they added a new one. So how does this, uh, and this is the feature, so you have like an object and you know a standard class, and inside also like another object. Actually this doesn't, yeah, it does correspond because the curly braces uh, creates a new object standard class. So this was a pull request, and they have a diff in GitHub, uh, so they, it got merged. And so they were actually changing only the inline uh, class, which is used by the parser, the YAML parser, uh, the YAML class, which has the parser method inside. So what they did is added a new argument, right? 
So why did this not break anything? Because uh, it didn't have an interface, so the YAML class doesn't have an interface. Maybe we should request one. Uh, it didn't, like it affected the, the signature of the, the signature is the, that, that's the signature. Like how many arguments, what arguments, where, what's their tab hint and stuff. It's, going, it's not going to go into um, 2.6 because it's not a break. Oh, it's, sorry, it's not a, uh, well, sorry. It is going to go into 2.6 because it's an addition. So it doesn't break the API, but it actually is added functionality. It's not a bug fix, so it's not gonna go in 2.5.1. Uh, if you were extending the YAML class and you actually added or overrode those, uh, that particular method, this would actually break your, your, um, your application. So let's unpack the implications of extending classes that are, don't have like a clear interface and also the rules that Symfony or other packages uh, create for us so that we can keep backwards compatibility. So there's a class which is extending a base domain and it's implementing a domain's interface. So it's got some methods and stuff. So let's look at a simpler example. So some class without extending and implementing, is, it has no contract, you can, it can change any time maybe. So we need, we, we're seeing that we need some rules of package design uh, for this. Suppose it extends a base domain only, but then you add a new argument too, and then the base, what do you do with the base domain? Do you add the argument, do you not? So uh, that creates some questions that we need to resolve. The same when you implement an interface, you have to, and you add a new argument, you have to do something about. So we're talking about now rules for package design. And Symfony has laid some rules. So if you actually uh, take a look at a class or an interface, and uh, you don't see any tags or any docs, doc blocks that say that it's an API class or an internal class or internal interface or anything, and it's just like that, like the, for instance, the JSON response class is like this, I think, and the JAML class is like this. So it can grow, so be careful. That's the, you, you don't want to extend that. You wanna ask for an interface or wrap it up as with the, um, tools that I'm gonna sp speak uh, later on. So suppose it has like an internal tag, doc block, that means that it's a non-public API, that's a private API for Symfony developers. You don't want to ex actually implement that class ever because you're, there m it might break, okay? So it's gonna grow, can shrink, or worse. And it could be, I think it cannot be deleted, but still, like you wanna be very careful. Now, if it's stuck with an API doc block, you actually want to rely on it, okay? Whether that is an interface or whether that is a class, you must focus on these type of classes, okay? So that means that it's, this stuff is set on the stone and you want to actually uh, do good things with it. Okay, so this is the example that I'm trying to uh, explain. Suppose, uh, and this is fine on the Drupal core, so they are extending Ajax response class from the JSON response. JSON response does not have an API, I believe, and it extends the response class which does have an API tag. But the JSON itself, the JSON response class does not. So it could change or it could happen something. So extending that class maybe is not the best way. We could actually create an interface for us inside Drupal, extend that class and then that'll be safe or easy, easier to track and we can have some tests and stuff and and track it with tests. I'm gonna speak about that later. On another bad example, or if I'm mistaken, please correct me this time. And I'm not, uh, you know, claiming here uh, uh, total truth. But this I found in also in the um, core of Drupal. So they are actually extending the event class uh, for uh, adding methods and properties. And you can see we, here we have three methods and a protected property and three public methods. That means when if this event class changes, it's gonna break, or it might break, <laughs> let me put it that way. So maybe it's not so good, maybe we need to approach this in a different way of you know, creating an interface, uh, pushing for some class that wraps this. Here's a good example. We're doing the container, we're extending the Symfony container, we have added some uh, overrides override to the method, that means this get and sleep exist or do exist inside Symfony uh, container. So this is a good example, why? Because we're overriding, but we're keeping the, uh, we're not extending the class in adding methods or properties. Okay, yeah, it's hard. Uh, 
you know, at some point you have to deal with it and understand this very clearly and just follow the rules, make sure like your software doesn't break, uh, add tests, and here's how, or, and then let's put an example. And YAML file loader is a class in Drupal core and it's also the name of a class in Symfony. So we said that we, Drupal was using YAML and it had a dependency, a loose dependency on the config component, but we're not using the config component in, in Drupal, okay? The problem is that this YAML file loader class in Symfony extends or has some dependency on the config component directly. We cannot use it. I mean, it's, if we use it, it's gonna break, error. So how, we d how it was dealt with, uh, this is, the, the, let's examine. So, what else I was saying, this is Symfony class that you can see on the namespace. Uh, you can see the red thing. That means uh, PHP Storm is detecting that those packages aren't in Drupal core, and uh, not even in vendors folder. So it's saying, you know, you're gonna run into problems. This file loader in particular, that's going to be another class that depends on the base file loader, which is uh, alias to the file loader, as you can see on line six, that is actually in the config component. That's pretty bad. I mean, for you, maybe it's not for Symfony framework, but it's, it's, it's not safe to extend. So what Drupal did is um, basically they created their own YAML file loader. They simplified, uh, but then in the way we lose features. We wanna keep track of Symfony's features, but we lost some features. We cannot like, for instance, do imports. So we cannot import another file, YAML file with some configuration in another folder elsewhere or in the same folder even, and then import it, we cannot do that. It has to be like a flood long, long file of Symfony or Drupal services uh, definitions. So I talk about, so what I did is basically I saw this and I jumped on Drupal org, I created a, a ticket, uh, actually I wrote tests uh, or I moved tests from the Symfony YAM, file YAML loader into um, the file YAML loader of Drupal, the implementation, which is completely separate, uh, but we want to keep track of the features so there is a pull request or like a diff I send there to actually add some things that we were missing because we are going to upgrade, remember, and we're gonna lose things that actually are added automatically and we, because we did our own implementation, we didn't add. So a good way to, to get upstream benefits when you upgrade is to track features via tests. That means write tests, Drupal is still learning uh, how to write tests, so I found uh, this problem. So I wrote the test, so is, this is the, the TDD way, the test-driven development way. You basically write the test first, uh, you get two failures, and that means that you're locking two features. And those features were exactly like the lazy uh, type of service definition, and the other uh, message that was actually in, uh, improved in Symfony for uh, some uh, tags. So the tags is, is a, it's a way you can tag service definitions. And those were different, so I just like did the change, make them ring, pass, and then send the pull request, or patch, or whatever. Another way that you could do outward, now we're talking outward, so the user land, uh, is creating your own interfaces. So Drupal needs to create their own interfaces. And so it, it, it creates a boundary that you can actually trust, so that you uh, do the changes in one place, in one class, one implementation, or you know, wrap it up, and we're gonna see an example of that. And then propose in work, like upstream to Symfony, hey, you know, you miss an interface here. And they say on the document to do those things, to create issues on Symfony, hey, you know, please consider adding an API tag to this interface or class. So taming hours, this is what Drupal did. Uh, Drupal created their own YAML, uh, our own YAML class and then we wrap, we, we're gonna wrap YAML, which is the symphony name there, uh, parse and dump methods into our inco encode and decode uh, methods. Pretty good, eh? And then we're gonna use all of this, uh, the, the encode and decode everywhere in Drupal. So when there's a, an, upstream change, an upstream change, then we just basically focus on one class, and that's about decoupling. Decoupling means like the, when your customer or whoever asked for, for Drupal a feature, and they need to change something, they change it, they touch one class only and not like the whole thing like we're doing now, maybe. Okay, so, yeah, and this is a joke, well, kind of joke because I found this in um, in, in Drupal core. We're using like, 
uh, type of registry, so the container, and we're passing it around like as a static, and this is pretty bad. Anyone seen the movie uh, uh, Green Lantern, the parallax, for those who are familiar, the acts of evil? So this is, as you can see here on line 38, so there is a comment, of course, you know, let's fix this. And I hope that we can work hard to actually fix, get rid of this in Drupal 8.0, 8.1, if possible. Uh, but I understand that there was a need for that because we're migrating, uh, you know, legacy code, uh, and this happens. This, this is temporary, of course. I'm just uh, mentioning. Okay, so we are talking about respecting encapsulation. So when you turn uh, properties, you know, there were some pull requests from Drupal land to Symfony. They were saying, oh, please, uh, make these properties public. And we're custom in Drupal to do that. And Symfony, by default, uh, sets their properties on their classes to private, the ones that are not, because it, we're talking about encapsulation. We have one class to do one thing. Uh, it's a single responsibility uh, approach. And we, if we turn those things public, then we break encapsulation. It's like, you know, people, it's like, you know, they'll take anything from you. And so we respect APIs. Also, we respect uh, our code. And we, there's a way that use deprecation. So in Symfony, sometimes in order before to jump to the next uh, version, like major version, uh, you want to maybe uh, use deprecation. That means you can have like the same things doing, like two things doing the same, but this one does it better. But this is deprecated. So you'll, you'll kind of help your users transition. That like you could still have that functionality. Your code is not going to break, but hey, there's this new thing that is better. And here I'm going to uh, stop a little bit to talk about the work in Drupal that some amazing people is doing. Uh, and I like this because uh, this comes from Sam. Sam, maybe it's around, but yeah, there he is. So he's done like a work on aesthetic like for a year or some more actually. And this is a diff I, I took from his work. You can check it out. It's basically about uh, addressing the assets problem in Drupal. And it's very interesting. And his approach basically involves cre the creation of some dependencies, some libraries. So he separate graphs to take a lo look at the problem and basically, okay, say, okay, this could be taken into a library. This other could be taken into another library because some other people might use it and might help improve uh, Drupal core or Drupal packages or the ones that the packages that it uses. So in this case, he's created like two libraries. In this case, Glyph, as you can see on line seven and eight, Frozen, and they address particular issues with uh, like the ordering of um, graphs, uh, Glyph, that's Glyph, and then Frozen, which basically wants to address the problem of when you want to create an object that you can freeze and lock. Uh, so, and how this is used, just take a look at the code and you will see that th those requirements are the functionality that what Drupal was needing for uh, make maybe ordering their libraries, their assets, and stuff. So it's pretty interesting and see how this is evolving. This is frozen. Basically, if you have a counter class, you can freeze it. You know, it's not frozen. It, you know, you increment it. It does increment from zero to one. Then you freeze it, and then you try to increment it, and then you get an exception. All right. So we're getting close. Uh, so this is the whole point. I mean, we're taming wild code, and I include Symfony code here also, not just Drupal. Uh, we're taming wild code because those, it's like balls, you know, they have horns and you have to, you really want to have control uh, of this thing. It's, it's nice code, it's, it's code that does a lot of stuff. Like I love Drupal because it's very practical, like it does stuff, it's, it, it, it gets the stuff done. And, but we have to tame it. And same with Symfony. So that's a new, uh, and I wanna see, uh, you know, maybe Drupal evolving into components, who knows? You name it. And for more information of my view, my point of view on Drupal, I've taken a look at the core a little bit. I've uh, written seven blog posts just this past two weeks. So you can check it out on craftedonline.com for more details specific uh, that, you know, is there out of the scope of this talk in particular. Uh, I also want to wrap up here the, the problem of versioning and semantic versioning and that we we must know to, to handle Drupal. I was participating also on the sprints, 
and uh, some people were asking about Composer and BHAD and the Twig and s s certain stuff that really, um, you know, I suggested, you know, let's decouple, let's decouple. And, and I really love the community for doing those sprints. I wish uh, Symphony could do more, more of those sprints, but it's great. Like, you have a great community. I, I am I'm very glad to, to be part of this community. So, and I want to recommend two projects. One of them is from my friend uh, Aaron. Uh, he's worked on Builder. Ever raise your hand if you ever wanted to actually have the functionality of Fin or, or Ant, you know, those uh, automatic builders, uh, but in PHP. Nobody? I do. So this is great. This, this project I'm using everywhere at work in open source. Gash uses it, and let's take a look at Gash. So you ever wanted, like, for contributing, you ever wanted to be really blazing fast at contributing and maintaining as maintainer? Of a, of a repository of packages. Uh, then take a look at Gash. I really uh, encourage you to do that. Gash is a project I started uh, maybe a year or something ago, maybe two years. And it has very like top level uh, intervention from these guys, Stock, Sebastian, and Dan uh, Leach uh, from UK. So it's really amazing how the architecture has evolved. And I really fully recommend, I'm using it at work, and I look like a beast because the pull request, like five pull requests in one hour or something like that. So it, I fully recommend. It works with uh, all the other, like the, you name it, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, uh, and GitHub Enterprise. Uh, we're going to make it work with Jira. And uh, actually, you're close to that already. It's, it's, all, it's already possible. And we're going to make it work with Trello, what, you name it. So I fully advise you to do that. And I'm actually taking also, is Alex Pot here? No, okay. He's a top developer in Drupal, and he has a patch to utilities a repo in GitHub that he uses for taking a look at the patches on Drupal.org. And I took that, and I'm cleaning it up, and I'm thinking that's a good addition for the Drupal family. So it might turn into an adapter. So you can actually, from the command line, uh, actually send patches to Drupal. That would be cool from the command line. So you don't have to click, 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 and, and get your elbows swollen. So, but you'll, you'll do that because, like, for people that do this many times a day, like, leave there, you want to have this. So, trust me. Thank you, well, my parents, and uh, thank you, Keith, if you're around. And Don, too, uh, the Drupal Association for bringing me here, helping me get here. And my friends, Kirk, um, Keith, and, and all people in the place I work at, Underground Elephant. So, uh, this is the link for uh, polling, the poll that I created. So if you like this talk or hate it or hate me, <laughs> you can go in there and click. And it's live, actually. So you'll see it real, real day. So that's it. And with that, maybe I'll take some questions, if there is any.